All right. Well, what do you say, Julianne and Martha? Should we slowly get started with introductions and I'll just admit people if others show up? Sure, that sounds great. Um, I'll, I can start. Uh, my name is Martha Bell. I'm the environmental educator from Island Heritage Trust. Um, and I'm delighted to do this webinar series with all of you. Um, it's kind of a nice thing where we all can share some of the things we've been up to and some things that maybe have been successful or things we want to share that others might want to try. So I'm glad to be part of it. Lander, do you want to introduce yourself and then maybe sure. others would like to pipe in and let us know where um, they're from. And of course, Julianne, we want to make sure that we all know Julianne before we get started. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thanks, Martha. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm very happy to be here as well. Um, if I don't know you already, my name is Lander and I work for Blue Hill Heritage Trust as the outreach coordinator. And um, yeah, Martha and I have, have tried to establish these monthly webinars for remote learning families and homeschoolers. And we're really excited to have Julianne with us this month um, and maybe months into the future as well. Uh, Julianne, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me um, on this morning. My name is Julianne Taylor. I am the lead naturalist with Bar Harbor Whale Watch Company. Um, and I've done, I've been very fortunate to do work with both Lander and Martha in the past, Blue Hill Heritage Trust and Down East Audubon and Great Pond Mountain Conservation Trust, um, doing education programs with them so I'm really thrilled to be again part of this to talk about what you can do in regards to marine science and whales specifically so it's great to be here and look forward to hearing about you know what I can do to help send resources your way that's awesome thanks Julianne if anyone um, in the audience wants to just share who they are and kind of where they're located and what they might be um, looking for from this webinar. We have a lot of resources up our sleeves and maybe what, what ages you're working with um, and what types of materials you're looking for. Please feel free to, to chime in now. Hi, am I the only one in the audience right now? <laughs> <laughs> we have a few others. <laughs> a few others? I can't see anybody else. <laughs> oh, I wonder why not. <laughs> Oh, I see you, Julie, and Martha. Um, okay, well, I guess I'll go. My name's Heather. I'm a homeschooling mom to a five-year-old. Um, we're pretty unschooled here and uh, don't have a formal program. We do meet with a homeschool group of about five other families, maybe 10 kids total once a week. Um, so that's our only like formal check-in. I really, I'm actually personally friends with Julie, so I saw the invite, I thought I'd check it out um, and see if there's any, any way that, you know, we could connect with you guys or get, a, get ideas or disseminate information to other families. So I have no clue what I'm doing or why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. It's nice <laughs> to meet you, Heather. I can go back now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. If, if anyone else would like to share, we have a couple of other people in the audience. If you don't want to, that's fine too. Um, but we'll give you a chance to do that. And then I think Julianne's going to um, get us started. All right, Julianne, do you wanna take it away? Sure, um, so I've kind of brought a few different things to talk about in the sense of what um, what's out there, which there is a lot in regards to marine science and, and even whales specifically, there's lots out there. So sometimes it can get a little overwhelming in, re in regards to searching and what to use, what, what really works. Um, so I, I pulled together some resources that I thought are fun and I'm familiar with. Um, 
But what I can offer through what I do here, um, I used to work with Allied Whale, and that's a really great relationship we have between the Whale Watch and um, Allied Whale. And I used to go to various places doing programs about whales, um, whales specifically. Um, so right now, of course, with COVID, but luckily with the access to you know, Zoom and Google Meets and virtual programs, um, I'm, I want to let homeschool groups know that I'm available um, if you ever wanted me to talk to your group um, virtually about whales, do a presentation. I've worked with age groups from little, little, littles, preschool kids, and I have a six-year-old at home, um, all the way up to high school. I taught high school for a few years. So much of what I will show you today and what I can do can certainly be modified to different age groups. It can certainly be modified based on, you know, what you're covering in your group. Um, so that's kind of the beauty of it. And, um, and you, you can really uh, modify it to however you feel it will best fit what you're trying to do um, with your kiddos. So um, there's, so there's that option. So again, I can do like the the PowerPoint presentation sort of thing and, you know, try and make it as interactive as possible, you know, especially for the, you know, for anybody, but for, for the younger kids. Um, and then in the past, I've connected classrooms um, with people who work in the field. So researchers, scientists that are, are doing work out studying whales. Um, I have a friend and colleague that's using drones um, to study whales. Um, there's kind of the, the drone research going on in like California that's called the snot bot that they collect um, whale blow so we can study, study all sorts of different cool things about whales. There's just a lot of really interesting research going on out there um, that if you're, if you actually want to talk specifically with people um, that I know they're kind of all over the, the world right now, but are usually very um, willing and exciting to talk to, talk to kids, talk to you, talk to, talk to the public about what they're doing and why they're doing what they're doing. Um, so that's, that's always an option if you're interested um, in trying to connect with a professional in the field. But I know a lot of, you know, what, what we're also talking about today is, you know, how can we also incorporate learning about whales in regards to being outdoors, being outside, being active, you know, that's really important. Um, and so I think right now, Lander, I'll try and share my computer screen. Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. Let's see. And while you're doing that, I just want to say welcome to some more people who have joined us. We're just getting started and Julianne is um, from Bar Harbor Whale Watch and she's getting us started. So welcome. Awesome. So um, one project we've worked with in the last year, um, and as you probably know, right whales are a really big topic um, in the New England area in Maine. Um, we of course also have the, the wonderful Calvin, Calvineers based in Castine, um, Bill McWeeny and his kids and all the work he's done. Um, and the Year of the Right Wheel Project is a project of a couple of colleagues and friends of mine that do work down in Massachusetts, but they've pulled together some really fun um, curriculum and activities. So when I was thinking, you know, how can you do an activity about whales outside? Um, one was this Right Whale Obstacle Course. And you can find these, and I know Lander, you'll um, which is wonderful. Thank you for doing this, but you'll, we'll share out all the um, links to these different um, activities. But yeah, this is just kind of gives you an idea of, you know, what, what you could do to build a course, you know, right now, if we're, you know, thinking about how this is a time animals are moving around, they're migrating from birds to, you know, various other animals such as whales. So this is an interesting and fun way to introduce, um, you know, how whales migrate, you know, maybe a bit about, you know, the obstacles, that's an obstacle course that they're, they're going through or trying to dodge as they're migrating south. 
So this is a very interactive, and it can be, I've done this with little kids, I've done this with older kids, um, but I was looking at um, migrating alewives and other um, migrating fish, so it can be adapted to other types of animals, um, other types of marine animals too. So that's kind of the other beauty of it. Um, but this is just an example of, of one fun thing you could do outside. Um, we also, or they also put together this right whale activity, uh, right whale in your driveway. So sometimes it's hard to kind of get an idea of scale of size of these animals. So um, this is kind of a fun way to, you know, get kids outside and you can measure, you know, the length of um, like how long a right whale or, or humpback whale would be. Um, you can find, you know, large space outside and do it. So this is, uh, this is also a really fun activity to do that gets you out. Um, and, you know, I think also when you're outside now that it's getting colder, um, you know, you can start thinking about, you know, what type of adaptations do whales and other marine or marine mammals, you, know, you can start thinking about, you know, what characteristics do we share with them? Well, they have to keep a constant body temperature. So how do they stay warm? So we're going outside. Well, with the exception of, you know, this week, it's going to be nice and balmy and warm, but it, it's something to think about when you're outdoors, you know, winter is a time we think about animal adaptations and how they survive in the winter. And you can certainly talk about that with whales and what, um, what adaptations they have um, to survive in an environment that's anywhere from 50 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees and warmer. Where they go, it gets warmer. So how are they gonna deal with that? Having lots of fat that they built up over the summer. Um, and you know we're getting into the holiday times, and I think a really neat thing about whales and about whale research, and this is a fun activity to do, is that um, this is a great way to connect with whales. You know, whales are, are individuals just like us. They have characteristics that make them look the same, but at the same time, they have physical characteristics like the callosities um, on their heads for right whales, for example, that allow you to identify different individuals. And over time, scientists have been able to real, or piece together family trees of whales, of right whales, of humpbacks, um, orcas, or killer whales. So there's different species you can do this with. But this is another fun, um, you know, thinking about the holidays, our family, our family tree. This is another way to relate whales to, to you, to people, to kids, that they can see, oh, a, a whale has a family tree just like I do. Um, so this is, this is just a fun, um, fun activity you can do in regards to, to that and has links to the places you'll, you'll need to get to, to get this information, um, like the right whale catalog. And, you know, there's mapping, really fun mapping activities. So, um, you know, there's a lot of STEM, of course, incorporated in what you can do with, um, whales and learning about whales and the ocean. Um, and right whale identification. Um, I did aerial surveys down in Georgia several years ago. And so you take pictures of whales from a plane and you can ID them using their callosities, which is um, what's circled in yellow. So this is kind of a fun way for kids to be the research scientists, be the scientists, go into the catalog and see if they can identify them based on their natural markings. Um, and you can do that with humpbacks too. And then just really quickly, um, a friend of mine who, who works on this project does this really fun program called uh, the Whale Mobile. And it's essentially this um, giant inflatable whale. Um, and we've been doing this for years, but she has this incredible whale. It's a humpback, a named humpback, a real humpback you'll see in the Gulf of Maine named Nile. And of course now with COVID, you know, she can't, she can't visit schools and libraries and she would travel all over, but she does them virtually. Um, and she can walk inside and it shows the organs and all the in, internal parts of the whale. And she does a really wonderful job and she's been doing this for years and has a lot of background in education has worked with um, kids of all ages or audiences of all ages. And, you know, if this is something that collectively in this group, um, as this, you know, we have people coming on a meeting, um, you know, I've been trying to team up with Cindy um, McInnes, who does this, and try and sponsor virtual a virtual program for a group of, of, of homeschool kids and schools that, you know, might still be um, meeting. So if this is something of interest, you can reach out to me and we can try and figure out something. Uh, usually she has like a maximum amount of kids or um, people she'll have logged on, but 
this is a really fun and she's really done a great job in adapting it so it's accessible to to anybody um and it's just a really fun way to learn about about whales and she can adapt it to any type of topic you're you're wanting to cover so there's that and then she has lots of really fun great um curricula and activities on her website too and um yeah and then i just kind of mentioned the calvin project and this is there's a documentary being made about it. i don't think it's out yet but this is a great way to kind of inspire kids like all over the place and you know if you're here in the area hancock county or even beyond beyond maine um it's a really inspiring story about kids that have taken on the role of being advocates for the species and you know what power and influence and change kids can have um, on the public and trying to I mean they go they go to conferences and they sing a, this incredible song and like all these scientists are like in tears because like they're they're like so incredibly wonderful and do such incredible work so this is just a very inspiring project I think for for kids to learn about um, and Bill, Bill McQueenie and his, his, uh, his students are great. Um, so that's, I think, what I have. <laughs> Hopefully I haven't gone too, too long. Um, I could obviously go on and on, but Not this, this is just a sampling of what's out there. And I'm happy to point people in the right direction. And, um, you know, I, I, I think hopefully we're also trying to put kits together that, that um, homeschool groups, you know, very similar to what the Blue Hill Library is doing and, and what um, Blue Hill Heritage Trust and French and Bay Conservancy did, is trying to have um, hands-on materials available. So that's in the works, and if we can pull that together, uh, we'll definitely let you know. Um, but that's something I'm happy to work on, too. Oh, that sounds amazing. Wow. Thank you, Julianne. Yeah. It would be super cool if we could pull together um, like that, that virtual right whale program for homeschoolers and in collaboration with Cindy and, and offer it. That'd be super neat. Um, definitely keep us posted on the kits because um, we can help advertise those. And I will include your email address if it's okay um, in the follow-up emails so people can be in touch with you about with follow-up questions. That was great. Awesome. Yay. Yeah, it was so enjoyable. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll tell you a little a little bit of what I've been up to lately. I've been kind of diving into birds. I've been working closely with um, a teacher, but everything is applicable to um, remote learners and homeschoolers. Um, I'm not a birder, I wouldn't say. I'm kind of just a naturalist that appreciates everything, but birders are great resources. There's a lot of people around that keep life lists and pay attention and will be resources for you. So um, if you know any birders in your life, they will be your friend during this process if you dive into birds. Um, I've been um, working with a fifth grade class. Um, last time that we met here as a webinar, we were talking a lot about seeds in the fall and you know getting out there to see how the plants are you know, reproducing, things like that. So I got together with my fifth graders and thought about, oh, all those seeds. Well, we're getting ready to go down to our bird feeding station. But I said, you know, what if we didn't have these seeds? What would we do? And, um, or what would the birds do? And so I gave them little tweezers and I said, okay, so if you're a little bird, what are you going to eat? So they went off and they had so much fun doing that. So it was a great activity just you know, everything from goldenrod to berries to um, pine cones. They were discovering all sorts of things and making their concoctions. And then I guess they wanted a little suet to hold it all together. And I think they thought they were gonna market their new bird feed. But um, anyway, it made them think about how, bird, how birds get their seed. And, um, and then thinking about where to start when you want to dive into the bird world. Um, there are so many guides out there. There's no shortage of materials when you're dealing with birds. So um, that's a nice thing too. Um, you know, you certainly have your, your bigger guides that can be something like these and they have so many pages. And when you're starting off, that sometimes can be a little bit tricky. So I like it when there are smaller amounts of things to think about. Um, some of these, you know, trifold, or I guess they're bigger than that, but these folding kinds of things, this is backyard birds, this is 
you know, the, I think it's uh, Earth, Earth, Sky, and Wind series, and they have ones on ducks, and they have ones on warblers, whatever you're doing. But sometimes having something smaller like that is easier to start with. Um, there are certainly books that are made for kids and birding. So here's a couple of them, wild, um, about Northeast birds. And certainly the region is really tricky. If you pick up a bird in all of North America, that can be a little bit hard. Um, so I always like it if you can get at least the Northeast, if not Maine. And um, another thing I sometimes do is I have these cards of all these different birds. And if I'm gonna just go out and I might just take the ones that I think I might see most easily would be like a blue jay. Oh, I have the pileated woodpecker in there because that was a thrill this week um, for the kids. A nuthatch, a junco, and a chickadee. And if I went out and this was what I was looking for, I think that could be a really successful trip. So um, ID is one thing. And then there are um, apps, of course. Um, many of you have heard about eBird, but there's Merlin, which is a wonderful ID app where you can um, say where you're birding and then the colors and the size and it really will narrow it down for you um, and that's a good way to dive into um, using apps for ID. Um, and then feeders, um, you know, where do you find the birds? Well in your backyard is probably the easiest place um, and there are so many different kinds of feeders. This is kind of a fun book here of using all sorts of used things, whether it's your bottles or, and they've taken a lot of, uh, I won't say artistic license, but just make sure, you know, it has a perch so the bird can land. But um, I think kids have a lot of fun trying to figure out um, how to make something. They usually get very creative and artistic. Um, so I kind of give them free reign. And then, um, then there's also the store-bought ones and some are more successful than others, those tube feeders for sunflower seeds are usually great. And just a platform. Um, some animals just, or birds like to just come on the platform or on the ground. Um, and it takes a little while for the birds to come, but um, it, it will be worth your weight. And um, a source of water, that can be a great thing. Um, and then think of last week, we were talking about doing coast week cleanups, right? Well, I found myself a suet feeder. Look at that. <laughs> These are just bait bags. Um, but it's a nice thing to just put suet in, hang it, and that works really well as a bird feeder. So lots of different kinds of bird feeders. And then there's always the things you find, right? You could go off on a search. And um, here I have some feathers that I just happened to come by. But feathers are really cool for a lot of different reasons. There's different types, you can tell the difference. We have some that are, um, um, look at this one here, I can pull it apart. But, have you ever done this? I can see a five-year-old over there. Have you ever taken a feather? Can I fix that? I wonder. Here I go, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna be preening my feathers. All right, so there we go. So we have primary feathers and we have downy feathers and we have shape feathers and um, all different kinds. And that's sometimes when you're looking, definitely those little magnifiers come in really handy. So take some time, really look. That's the other thing about birding is it does take a little time. It isn't always right in front of you. You have to sit with it for a minute and really look and see what's right in front of you. Um, and let's see here. Um, I had a couple books that um, I actually gave to a teacher, but one that I came across was about um, Audubon, who was in the 1800s, a fabulous birder, but he figured out just being curious, put that wire around the leg of a bird and figured out migration. So that was pretty amazing. And the book was written as about his childhood, which was great. And then I came across one about Roger Tory Peterson. So it was like, okay, well, I have something from the 1800s. I have something from the 1900s. So that was great. And then I went to a yard sale and I found prints of Audubon's that were just like a coffee 
card table, a coffee book table. So every kid got a different print and now they're drawing birds and they're all excited about being the next ornithologist of the, mm -hmm. um, the next century. So that's been kind of fun. Um, there's a bingo type game. Um, you can make them, but you know, you can do cards like this and then you end up with cards like this and you cover them up and just, or concentration, if you have doubles playing concentration games, that's a good way to um, kind of remind you of what birds are out there. You don't always have to know the names, but it's good just to get more familiar with them. And then, um, let's see, oh, this was another yard sale one. This is bird songs. Is anyone into music? So there, obviously you got, there's plenty of apps you can have and hear the music, but I could open up a page here Let's see here, turn this on. Let's see what I, oh, I had 71 here is what it was written. Um, my glasses. <laughs> 60, 70. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, here's 71. And if I press my button here at 71. <coughs> so every one of these pages has a different bird. You plug in the number and then you get the call. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right, so that could be fun. So if we put a kit together, I think I'll put that in the kit too. Um, and then um, any kind of art, it, drawing birds, it's, if you do like a little circle and then another oval one on a slant, you have the, the head and the body, and then just putting together, you know, the neck and the tail feathers and the beak. And it's amazing how quickly it really looks like a bird. So it takes a little bit of time, but I really would encourage people to um, give it a try because there's nothing like drawing to really pay attention to what things look like. Um, let's see here. Um, now I've done a lot of, so this week we were doing um, with the group that I'm working with is a very scientific study. So this is how the scientific study goes, is we take the kids on the school nature trail and we go down to our bird feeding station and we have to take, we're, we have a question that we have to answer and it might take, for, it's probably gonna take all months, maybe even several months. And do more birds come to the feeder on cloudy days or sunny days? And so we go down to our feeding station and we sit on the benches and for three minutes, we have to count how many birds visit our bird feeding station. And we document that. And we'll, so we're collecting data, we're collecting temperature, and we're collecting cloud cover. And we even actually now have a solar meter now to tell, because cloud cover can be a little bit tricky. So another very high tech tool here that the kids love using, it's about solar radiation. And with those five pieces of data, and we collect those every day, we'll probably do a peer review scientific paper and have it published in a, um, a journal through uh, Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And it's something that homeschoolers could do too. But my point is that it's just, you're doing something very scientific, but it really is very simple and very enjoyable. I mean, the kids get their three minutes of counting and they're like, oh, can we do that again? Um, and, you know, sometimes it's just chickadees and nut hatches, but then, you know, all of a sudden the hairy woodpecker shows up and then the pileated's around the corner and, oh, there's more sparrows now and, oh, those crows are coming in. So anyway, it's, it's a great study and um, simple is sometimes best. So we're having fun with that one. Um, doing something like a comparison of crows and ravens. Um, again, not, not the whole hundreds of birds in one book, but just taking two species and having kids run around like, so a crow is more likely to flap its wings and a raven is more likely to soar. 
So if I was a five-year-old, I don't know where my five-year-old is here, but if you could run around and soar and then be ravens and you could flap your wings and be crows, and then you could um, caw a lot if you want to be a crow. And if you want to be a raven, you have almost have like a croak. I'm not very good at the croaking part, but it's kind of a deep croak. You could work on that. I think that could be an activity unto itself. Um, and then, um, oh, I did something with great blue herons a couple of weeks ago. We had a great big giant tarp and we had, I had some stuffed animals underneath that were attached to strings and some were frogs and some were fish. And there were some of them I just, you know, like were little drawing kinds of things. They weren't very fancy, but I pulled on one of the strings and the blue heron had, all, all the kids were blue herons around the tarp. And just as it moved, they had to figure out where it was and where it was going and they had to catch it. And it was so simple, but it made them think of how alert a great blue heron had to be. I'm sure you've watched great blue herons just sit and wait. Well, I made them sit and wait and be very perceptive of what was going on. Um, and we did another gull day. There's a lot of, you know, they always want to say, oh, it's a, just a seagull. Well, there's a lot of different kinds of gulls, right? So we were playing games that involved just asking questions and running to different cones if it was a great blue, a black bat, I'm sorry, a black back or a herring gull or a ring-billed gull. So they just got used to the, the names and um, some of them were confusing questions, so we all got to laugh. Um, so those were fun ones. And then one of my favorite activities to do with kids, this is more inside, but um, is fill the bill where there's lots of different, um, some of you might be familiar with Project Wild. Well, they have Flying Wild too. And fill the bill is this activity here. Um, but you put out a bunch of tools that represent different beaks. So you might have something like a strainer for a, a duck that's gonna strain duckweed, or you might have um, tweezers that are gonna go after something, or you might have um, chopsticks. And you end up putting things like, let's say rice underneath the bark of a tree. This would be like inside in a container. And then you get three tools. You might get, you know, the strainer, the tweezers or the, um, the tongs and what tool worked best and why. So you talk a lot about that. So uh, there's a lot more to it and I'll put that in the set of resources, but that's always been a fun activity to just think about beaks. Um, and let's see here. Um, oh, and then there's a lot of citizen science projects around uh, birding as well. Um, the backyard counts and the Christmas counts and things like that. And I, I know there's many more. I haven't looked them all up, but if you really got into it and you wanted to be involved in a project, um, that would be great. Oh, and binoculars. Um, binoculars are great. Kids' binoculars sometimes can be difficult to use. So I wouldn't be overly eager to give kids binoculars, but they can try it. I'm working a lot with fifth graders right now. At first, they were really into using the binoculars but they're much more into just getting close to the birds and being quiet. Oh, and right now the real highlight is the birds are start, the chickadees are starting to land on the kids' hands and on their heads. Whoa. So <laughs> there's no greater thrill than that. So, <laughs> um, I think that's all I have for now. And then, oh, there's, you know, you can talk about migration and, um, you could just go on and on, as you know, but, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of resources and there's a lot of people. So I hope birds get you excited at some point. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Martha. <laughs> I'm super excited and I can't wait to see your resources and I will put them in our follow-up email so everyone can access them who's registered. Cool. I'll do, um, my quick sharing. And then if people have questions about anything that we've talked about so far, um, we can dive into that. All right, let's see if I can get my screen sharing to work. Um, okay.
Okay. Can can you see that? All right. Can can you hear me and see my screen? Awesome. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to share a few ideas for outdoor learning and a few things that I love to do with kids and that are easy to do in your backyard. Um, the, the first one is a very simple recipe for pine needle tea. It's a wonderful drink at this time of year. It's full of vitamin C and can help boost the immune system at this, this colder time of year. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a few different um, kind of evergreen activities as the leaves are falling now and the evergreens are really um, becoming more of a focus in our forests and in our landscapes. I wanted to share a few things that you can go out and um, do and engage with with these particular trees. Um, so I will include the pine needle tea recipe in the follow-up as well, but it's quite simple and quite yummy. This is another recipe, um, a little bit more advanced, but also really fun to make. Um, this can be done with pine needles or spruce needles. Um, and it was taught to me by um, Ken Benton at North Branch Nature Center in Vermont. And he does a lot of wild edibles with um, schools and community groups. And this one is called, um, he calls it porcupine bread, uh, but it's basically you make a sugar, um, a spruce sugar or a pine sugar. You collect your pine needles or spruce needles, making sure you identify them correctly. You dry them, and then you can take a mortar and pestle or I guess a blender or even just your fingers and um, crush them up, mix them with some sort of granulated sugar, and then you have this really amazing smelling um, kind of flavored sugar that then you can put into basically any recipe you want. But um, I, I love to make it um, over the fire with um, a corn cake recipe. And so I will share that with you as well. And that's kind of a fun way to, to dive into wild edibles. And whenever I'm doing programs with kids or schools about harvesting from the wild, I try and always share The Honorable Harvest, which is from Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, um, and is also just a part of most in indigenous cultures. Um, and the basis is take only what you need, use all that you take, um, and, and, and say thank you. And that there's, there's a little bit more to it and you can um, read that as well. That will be included in a handout. Um, and just a, a good thing to always think about as we're, we're taking and gathering from the wild or, or any place. Um, another activity that you can do with pine needles, and I actually haven't done it yet, but I've wanted to for a really long time. And my friend the other day was making one and I can send you a link to a little tutorial, um, but you can make a pine needle basket. And um, white pine needles are, can be a little fussy because they're pretty small and thin, but it's totally possible. Um, and then if you have access to red pine, <laughs> pine needles, um, that would probably be a little bit easier. So um, basically all you need are the, the needles and some, um, some string and some tutorials show a little bit of a piece of a straw that has a slit in it that's called a gauge. Um, but it's, it's, very, it's pretty simplistic on the side of materials that you need um, and, and a needle as well but I will send out that tutorial if you're interested in diving into a little bit more of a complicated craft. And it's important to gather the pine needles before the snow falls as well. So if you're interested, you go out and start gathering now. Um, a simpler craft with the evergreen, um, you can make little fairy brooms. If you have younger children who are interested in building fairy houses, it'd be really fun to have a little fairy broom in the fairy kitchen. They also work well um, as paintbrushes, and they kind of give this interesting texture to the background of a painting. This is a story that I'm gonna share with you, and I thought if, you're, if you decide to make pine needle tea and drink it, you could read this story. It's written by one of my friends, and um, it kind of, it talks a little bit about the honorable harvest, and um, this, this, this little mouse who, um, goes to gather pine needles for tea and kind of what happens when the mouse takes too many pine needles. Um, it's a very, very sweet story. So I will send that out as well. Um, and then kind of moving away from the evergreen theme, um, I wanted to share last month in case you weren't here, um, I was kind of promoting our wild sun catcher program, which is, um, which happens monthly and focuses on celebrating a different uh, wild plant. Um, of our area and for last month for October it was um, cranberries 
and we we created kits um, where you would get a piece of muslin and a stamp pad and you could experiment with uh, making a dye from the cranberry as well as um, making stamps from the cross section of a cranberry and we're, we are out of kits at this point but I wanted to share this with you so that you could do it on your own if you're interested um, and I will share the video link as well um, it goes through several different people sharing about cranberries we have a little tour of a, a local cranberry bog and um, a couple of craft um, projects within the video as well and then um, included in the kits, which I'm going to share with you. I'm really into storytelling, as you, as you might be able to um, be, be catching on. Um, there, there's also a story called The Three Red, Red Witches in the Cranberry Bog um, that we shared in the kits. And it kind of goes into a little bit of the folklore of cranberries and witches for this time of year around Halloween. And along with the stories, there are curricular connections. Um, and so you can kind of see on this slide here, I'll, I'll share this as well, but it talks a little bit about the place-based ecology of cranberries, the natural history and folklore, um, ways to further explore um, the cranberries and kind of some of the concepts within the story, and then ways for, for students or children and families to reflect and share. Um, and so I will, I will send that out as well if you'd like to use it. Um, and then I just wanted to put this in kind of in the middle of what I'm sharing, just as a reminder. Um, I think it's probably all on our minds, but if you're out um, wild foraging or hiking the trails, um, just to be uh, wearing orange pretty much at all times and um, hiking is definitely best on Sundays. Um, and then I just wanted to share, I don't know if, if any of you have done this before, but it's kind of a fun craft. Um, is making your own nature journal. And this might go along really well with um, what Martha was talking about with the birds and bird drawings. Maybe you make a nature journal and then put your, your bird drawings um, in the nature journal. It can be fun to create a cover with um, plant prints. And at this time of year, this is more of a, a summer craft, but you could probably still find some, um, some foliage out there to use. Um, but it's, it's fun, or if you have house plants or garden plants, or even just a few sprigs of um, parsley or something from the grocery store, uh, that you, but you take a hammer um, and a piece of cloth and a paper towel, and you lay the cloth down first on something that it's okay to pound on. You lay the paper towel over it, and then you pound the hammer, and it makes these beautiful prints. And that can be used to make the cover of a nature journal. And this is a really simple kind of outdoor forest school version of a nature journal where you just need um, a piece of cardboard for the back, some paper, a cover, a stick, and some rubber bands or some yarn. And that can be really fun to make and really easy to add paper to as well. And then I think um, the last thing I wanted to share is our Wild Sun Catchers program for the month of November is gonna be focused on asters. And currently we have free kits at the Blue Hill Public Library. You can call um, Claire. The, the library's number is 374-511. Oh gosh, I'm blanking. Anyway, I'll, I'll send out um, Claire's email and the library's number. So if you're interested in getting in contact about a free kit, um, you can do that. And within the kits this month, there will be um, supplies to start your own winter nursery for native plants. Um, so there'll be some pots um, that Mainscape generously donated. There'll be some soil, a little bit of sand, um, probably some aster seed ID cards, um, and some instructions on how to get your winter nursery started. And we still have those kits available, so you can reach out and get one if you're interested. Um, and another thing about the wild sun catchers is we've been doing it all year. And so on the Blue Hill Heritage Trust website, and I think the library website as well, um, we have the videos from past months. And so if you're interested in checking those out, they are very seasonal. Um, and so a lot of the plants probably won't be around, but um, they still can be fun to browse and something to know about for next year as well. All right. So I think that's, um, that's all I have. And I think I will just stop my share and we can open it up for questions about anything that has been shared during this this webinar. And I think that there were a few, um, a few things in the chat box that I noticed as well. Hey, Lander, I had a comment if I can. Yeah. Hi, it's me. I'm wearing my mask because Beth and I are working together. 
Um, I'm Chrissy at Blue Hill Heritage Trust, and we're, we're co-workers with Lander. And I wanted to say, I thought of it when Martha was talking about all the bird stuff. The trust has a nice little library of ID books and even some books on how to do various backyard bird feeders. I actually just gave one to Lander. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of resources that we're very happy to loan out to folks if they want to use those books before they make a purchase of their own copy. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us and we can meet you at the door and show you what we have and, uh, and loan them out like our own little library service. Awesome. Thanks for that, Chrissy. Mm -hmm. I love that idea. That's great. Um, yeah, feel free to just ask questions. I see a few in the chat box. Um, in terms of the pine needle tea, I guess I didn't make that completely explicit. So it's green needles. So the ones that you just would take right off of the tree or if a branch has fallen in a storm recently. Um, but yes, you, you want the ones that are, that are green and still kind of vibrant and full of their juices. As much juice as needles have. Um, and then somebody asked, um, what kind of owl call um, did you play, Martha? What was the bird? Oh. Um, what was it? It sounded like like the who cooks for you, who cooks for you, maybe bar, barred owl? Barred, barred owl, I think it was, but I just want to make sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was it? It was 70. Mm -hmm. It was 71. I'm pretty sure it was barred owl. Barred owl. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's see. I'll... I just hear it outside my bedroom yeah. window often, and I just, I'm like, I'm, yeah, that's what it is, it's right? The, it's the who cooks Sorry. for you, and I'm like, I never knew exactly which one it was. Thank you, Mark. Yes, no, that that's what it is. I'm, I wanted to double check, but I'm actually pretty certain. So, um, when I get there, I'll, I'll chime in again when I find it. <laughs> okay. Are there any oh, other seven. questions or comments? Well, well, we'll let Martha look for another second, but thank you all for joining us today. Um, uh, Lander. Yeah. That um, porcupine bread, was that something you're gonna share with us in the chat or? Yeah, so I'm gonna send a follow-up email to all of okay. you and everyone who has registered and couldn't be here today um, right. with PDFs, with those okay. recipes and any other resources that Martha and Julianne have shared whether they're like um, online links or PDFs, uh, like attached documents. Um, so you'll get all of that, yes. And if you have any questions as you're like using those resources, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us and I will include all of our emails as well. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. Lander? Yeah. Is there gonna be a November program uh, with you and Claire about Aster? There is. Yep. There will be a video. Um, and generally we have, it's like me doing something from Blue Hill Heritage Trust and Claire doing something from the library. And then we generally have a community guest. And this month, I think will be the first month that we don't have a community guest. Just both of us are really busy. And so we're just going to do it, the two of us. But we will have a video that talks about aster ecology and kind of natural history and then um, kind of a demonstration on how to set up a winter nursery as well. And that will be coming out. I think it's the last Wednesday in November. It kind of premieres and then the recording is available after that. Um, and I can't remember exactly when the kits will be available, but they should be available in the next couple of weeks to pick up at the library. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> there's a bar now. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. That's your bar I will. <laughs> Thanks, Martha. I was getting confused be between my bird numbers and my bird pages. I apologize. I get one of those books. <laughs> yeah, they're fun. <laughs> cool. Well, if there are any last questions, we're happy to, to take them. Um, otherwise, definitely um, look out for a follow-up email with all the resources and We'll include the recording of this as well in case you want to share it with friends. Um, yeah, and then we have another another one of these coming up next month. I think it's December 4th. It's the first Friday of every month. Um, and 
again, it'll be me and Martha and maybe Julianne, if she's interested, we'll talk with her. And then we also have um, Tate Yoder, who is a um, local, um, wonderful um, photographer and filmmaker. And he's gonna share tips on how to do nature photography with families and kids. Um, so that will be really fun too. All right. I have a question. One more question. Yeah, Sorry. of course. We, we still have time. <laughs> have, you, have you ever done um, any kind of a presentation on um, foraging, wild foraging for mm. edibles? I haven't done a presentation myself. Um, I've worked with groups of kids. I actually, maybe I'll send this to you as well. I, we do at Blue Heritage Trust have a wild edibles kind of like safety protocol and how to go <laughs> about doing it safely with groups of kids. Um, so I can send that along as well, just to give you that idea of some of the steps that we take to make it as safe as possible. But we also, um, we have a Friends from the Field webinar series, and if I, I'll try and remember to send this link as well, um, that Island Heritage Trust and Blue Heritage Trust does. And we had somebody, a local herbalist, come and talk about sustainable foraging, and she, she did a beautiful presentation all about that this summer. Um, so I could send you that link as well, and that would be a good, a good okay. reference. That would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's really, really fun. And then there's also like certain things that you do want to know about it before just like launching into Absolutely. eating things. Yeah. That yeah. You're not quite sure no, we're <laughs> just, we're just hungry at the organization for things to do with kids or schools or, you know, classrooms and things like that. So that's why I'm here just to yeah. see we're, what things I can steal from you guys. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you work, Bev? Island Readers and Writers. Okay, cool. Awesome. And Lisa, who was here earlier, but she had to go to her other job, number two. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So you're you're doing online programming still with the schools, but not in person. Oh yeah, absolutely. We are. So you're crazy busy this right. fall with. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we had 18 schools. Whoa. Um, involved in virtual programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. It was great. Well, it is great still going on. Mm. And if ev anyone ever wants us to try to tackle a subject that they're really curious about and gives us a heads up, we'd be glad to uh, do a little research and brainstorming and um, help meet some of your requests. So keep us in mind. Absolutely. That's a really good point, Martha. And you can, e yeah, just email any of us with, that, with those requests and we can try and make it happen. Awesome. Well, I feel like we're, we're coming to an, a wrap up time here. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for, for joining us today. And we'll, we'll send out follow up email and um, look out for the link for December if you're interested. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>